Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us at tonight's very special program. My name is Roger Smith, and I have the great privilege of serving as Director of Community Outreach for Senior Citizens Incorporated, Savannah's premier and oldest nonprofit organization for providing services designed to keep our community seniors in the homes of their choice for as long as possible. Less than two years ago, an unusual project came to the attention of Senior Citizens, Inc. The phenomenon known as naturally occurring retirement communities, neighborhoods in which a higher than average percentage of people over the age of 55 have aged in place, provides organizations like ours a unique opportunity to customize services for high densities of seniors who are quite literally each other's neighbors. Through a generous grant from the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta, Savannah's Ardsley Park, Chatham Crescent, and Olin Heights neighborhoods were designated as just such a community, the first official one in Georgia outside of the Atlanta metro area. Senior Citizens, Inc. was named as the lead agency that would identify these seniors, assess their needs, and to the greatest possible degree, make an appropriate response. As these Savannah seniors were identified and their needs assessed, we at SCI heard in large measure what we expected to hear. Services such as home delivered meals, transportation to doctors and groceries, light housekeeping and so on made their requisite appearances on the list of needs. However, the seniors of Ardsley Park had more to say than just that. A generally well-educated and intellectually curious group, these neighbors of Senior Citizens, Inc. asked for something altogether different. They told us that what they most wanted was a nearby, affordable, and academically rigorous educational outlet, a place where they could meet each other and at the same time work with qualified instructors and lecturers to explore subjects and issues that for many of them had been put on long-term hold during a lifetime spent building careers and raising families. This demand served as the impetus for a brand new project that we called the Learning Center at Senior Citizens, Inc. Now, I pride myself on knowing my wonderful hometown extremely well. So from the very outset of this project, it was clear to me and indeed to all of us at Senior Citizens that the Learning Center's success was completely dependent upon forging alliances with the great humanities institutions of Savannah and all of Georgia. Jewels in the crowns of Georgia's humanities community were our means to an effective program. And I'm pleased to report to you tonight that all of these organizations have enthusiastically answered our call. When I was asked late last year about my estimate for success in the first inaugural term of the Learning Center courses, what I predicted was a modest success. But with the help of the Savannah Morning News and WTOC Television, success was anything but modest. Seven of the Learning Center's eight courses have completely filled, and several of them have substantial waiting lists. We at SCI are most grateful to the entire Savannah community, not just Ardsley Park, for a ringing endorsement of the work we are doing. I also knew from my experience as a longtime Savannian that the people of this community turn out for high quality programs, particularly when the spokesperson in question has a little bit of star quality. And without transgressing the boundary of a speaker introduction, which you will hear in just a moment, I believe that it is safe to say that tonight we are indeed in the presence of a star. I wish to thank the members of the host committee whose names are listed in your program. Without their significant financial commitments to this event and the contributions of other donors, your admission to the theater tonight would certainly not have been free. And indeed the event itself might not have happened at all. I wish to thank also the institutional partners listed in the program, each of whom has played a unique role in bringing this event to fruition. Finally, allow me to introduce you to the woman whose direction of Senior Citizens Incorporated over the past decade has made our organization an effective, innovative, and flourishing institution that serves seniors all over Chatham County and beyond. The positive and nurturing professional environment which, which she creates at Senior Citizens, Inc. allows me and all of my colleagues to dream ambitiously and then to make those dreams realities. To introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Patty Lyons.
you tell it's close to performance evaluation time after those kind words? <laughs> it is truly a privilege to stand here in front of you tonight, not only because I represent an organization whose mission I believe is truly vital to this community, but it is an honor to introduce you to a remarkable person. When we were looking for someone to help senior citizens launch the Learning Center, we wanted someone who was recognized as an intellectual, was respected by all age groups, was articulate, able to relate to our organization and mission, and someone who was entertaining to boot. That was no small affair, build affair to fill, but we found that and so much more with Dixie Carter. Dixie Virginia Carter was born in McLemoresville, a very small community that boasts now it is up to 259 people, and it's in my home state of Tennessee. She grew up in a strong, loving family that allowed her to explore all aspects of her talent and she became a talented and recognized actress, singer, and author. But most importantly, she turned out to be a really great person. She has appeared in numerous roles on Broadway in productions such as Thoroughly Modern Millie, Pal Joey, and Masterclass. And she and her husband, Hal Holbrook, last year completed two new plays, including a run in Kate Clark's two-character play, Southern Comforts. And she told me that the roles that she is most proud of on the stage are two in, in two Oscar Wilde plays, Lady Windermere's Fan and A Woman of No Importance at the Shakespeare Theater in Washington. She has won numerous awards recognizing her talent, including the Shakespeare Theater Millennium Recognition Award and the recent opening of the Dixie Carter Center for the Performing Arts and, and Cultural Advancement in Tennessee. And while she's been continuously bu busy as an actress, she has found time to share her singing and cabaret skills, completing 11 seasons at the Cafe, Cafe Carlisle. And she's the author of a delightful book called Trying to Get to Heaven, Opinions of a Tennessee Talker. <laughs> but it is her roles on television that she's perhaps best known for. Ms. Carter has portrayed Randy King, a larger than life attorney with a colorful past in family law, she played an outrageous and superficial grandmother in, in Ladies' Man, but she's perhaps most loved for being the erudite, quick-witted Julia Sugarbaker on Designing Women. After all, who of us hasn't, hasn't dreamed of sitting on that couch at Sugarbaker's dishing the world with those sassy Southern ladies? But to me, it is her latest role as Gloria, Orson's mother on Desperate Housewives, that intrigues me most, <laughs> being a person that works with seniors for a living. Here is a character in her first appearance in the series that declared exactly what we try to do at Senior Citizens every day. Help folks as they age have a choice, if possible, on where they want to live. As she stole the van from the nursing home, turned to Bree and yelled, I am not going back to that place, I cheered. <laughs> now granted, those of you who know Gloria's character on the show know that she's really not a nice person but that has nothing to do with her age. So, now while everything pointed to the fact that Ms. Carter would be a perfect person to launch the opening, you know, you never really know. In my heart, I wondered, was her portrayal of Julia Sugarbaker just good acting? Did she really write that great book? Could anybody be as funny, smart, and charming as she seemed? Well, I can tell you that she is. Over the past few months in her correspondence to us at Senior Citizens, Ms. Carter has quoted Proust. She's talked about how she's discovered that as growing older, she has gained the wisdom to appreciate the great works of literature that she never would have at a younger age. And she has generally wowed us all with her kindness, her honor, and her wit. And while I only officially met her last night, her graciousness, warmth, and infectious joie de vivre has completely charmed me. Truly, in the few hours I have spent with her, including a stand at the airport bar to watch the end of the Indianapolis Colts game, <laughs> where, we, where we cheered on a fellow Tennessean, Peyton Manning, she has given me many moments that I will remember always. But best of all, I know that last night was just the beginning and that all of us will leave tonight with moments such as those to cherish. Therefore, it is with immense pleasure that I present to you Ms. Dixie Carter.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Sorry for popping this. Thank you. Those of you whom I've met who've been so generous with your welcome and so kind. This is my first time to come to Savannah, Georgia. My husband always has said to me, you have to see it, Dixie, but I'm only just worried that you're going to insist on buying a house and moving there. <laughs> so could we, do you think, is Jim here, do you think we could raise the lights a little bit so that I can see our audience just a tiny bit? I'd love to see you all. See, <laughs> can we raise the audience size just a little tiny bit? I want to Thank Roger Smith for, oh, that's better. That's good, that's good, that's good. Now we can see each other a little bit. I want to thank Roger Smith. I know uh, those of you I've met have told me how grateful you are for his, what he's doing here. I want to thank him for getting me here. And uh, Patty Lyons, who has a really great career ahead of her as a sportscaster. I was so scared. It's horrible, isn't it, to just care, get to caring about something so much you lose your... I couldn't look. First of all, it was rude to come off the airplane and say to my two completely up to that point uh, unknown uh, uh, hospitable hosts are meeting me. They've gone to the trouble to go to the airport and get me to say, I can't go to my hotel yet. I have to stay in this airport, please, and watch this football game to its conclusion. <laughs> and, I, and, they, and they just went along with it. It was horrible. And then, God is good, Patty said, I am a huge Tennessee fan and a Peyton Manning fan also. So we clutched each other, and while Roger was getting my bags, I, we were watching the fourth quarter, and I was just sitting this way in the bar and holding, as a strange woman should not do to another <laughs> person, holding on to her so tight and saying, I can't look. Just tell me. Just tell me. And, then she, and I, t I promise Peyton Manning should be thanking Patty Lyons because when she started sportscasting, their fortunes changed. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's a funny thing. But when she calmly took over, the passes started being completed. And then she said that great thing in the last minute when Tom Brady was moving down the field. Interception. Yes. When she said, <laughs> interception. Hallelujah. So, and then today, uh, we had a little short uh, tour. And Renzi Smith, who's uh, a docent at the Episcopal church, St. John's Episcopal, show, carefully and in detail showed us around that beautiful home. I can't remember the, uh, the green Mer Meldron. I'm, I haven't gotten it right yet. Someone had to spell it for me. M-E-L-D-R-O-N? M-E-L-D-R-I-N? I give up. I give up. I'm going to write it down, though. I'm, I'm not going to take any more of your time saying that, uh, that name of that house. But how beautiful your city is and how much I admire you for being able to hold on to a great beauty that you have here. And I understand that there's been a little discussion as to whether the architecture should move along, you know, with the times, but I, I was saying tonight earlier, for me, for a person like me who comes in to your city for the first time, I'm so grateful that you've just held it and kept rebuilding in the way that you are. It's, it's an American treasure. I'm telling you all what, you pass up New Orleans, you pass up San Francisco, you, you, this is it. This and Paris, France are it for me now. I'm just telling you that. And I'm not so sure about Paris. <laughs> All right. I wanted to say this. I mean, I, I have a lot to, to say and, and feel entirely inadequate to articulate it in the way that I would hope to about what you're doing here about the Learning Center. 
One of my grandmothers would have been particularly thrilled. She attended the Brownsville College for Women in Brownsville, Tennessee, and she remembered her Latin and her Greek, and she would have so admired what you're up to here. I've written Good Evening. I'm in great respect of what you all are doing here and touched that you wanted me to come and be with you this evening, and that's the truth, touched and humbled. You know, to get a phone call from Roger Smith that, I mean, puts a lump in my throat, to, to get a phone call saying that you're doing this, that you're creating this learning center, and that you want me to come and be present um, to uh, open or inaugurate it or celebrate the, the opening of it is, is uh, I, I want to let you understand, if I can, that it's um, very meaningful. And it's a tremendous compliment. I just I want you to know that. I, I don't think I really have, have um, I, I'm not qualified to respond in the way that I would like to, but I'm responding, so here. <laughs> I thought you might like me to tell you a little bit about myself. When I go out and speak, usually the question and answer part, it turns out that the audience members really wanted to know more about Delta Burke than <laughs> what my thoughts were, <laughs> than my meaningful thoughts, but so, so, but because of that, I say, I thought you might want me to tell you a little about myself and where I'm from and who my folks are and how I got out to Hollywood. But before I do, I do want to say something about the uniting aspect of this evening, even more uniting perhaps than our being Southerners, which is a terrific bond. Have you ever noticed that we Southerners are feel like a group, we're much less divided by our statehoods, I think, than other parts of the country. I travel around quite a, a good deal, and, and when I get to a southern state, I feel like I'm home, even if it isn't Tennessee. Don't you all agree with, anyway, I think that's true. Even more uniting, perhaps, than our being, <laughs> than our, <laughs> thank you, than our being southerners, and that is our age. Most of us here are not kids anymore, and that's what brings us together tonight. What do you all think of when you first wake up in the morning? Do you have the same kinds of thoughts you did 20 years ago? If you do, good for you, and I congratulate you. I don't. My waking thoughts are entirely different now than they used to be. So often now, I wake up thinking about time, how it has flown, how it is flying. I've always tended to be nervous and a worrier, but I used to worry about immediate circumstances, what to do about a failing marriage, would I get the next job, were my children happy in their school, could we get another dog? I can't remember exactly when I started waking up with questions about whether or not I have wasted days and months and years of my life doing things that didn't count for me or for my children. The anxiety level that accompanies these kinds of thoughts is painful, sometimes very painful. Missed opportunity is hard to look back on but wasted time is even harder to accept. This sense of let's hurry up and live started to come into focus on or just very close to my 60th birthday, I think. <laughs> right around there. And now it doesn't seem like such a bad thing at all. Hurry up and live. Now I feel grateful for being prompted, I guess, by physical changes that are impossible to ignore, to really look at what I'm doing every day and try to eliminate the dross. I am married to a wonderful man, 
who spoils me as much as he can and agrees with me as much as he can, which I greatly appreciate. He's made an effort to be respectful of my religion and my politics and has even come to agree with me on certain things like the fact that he is, if not as politically conservative as I am, a traditionalist, he calls himself now, who holds classical ideals and ideas dear to his heart. Truth to tell, I believe he's more conservative in many ways than I am, but I hate to spoil his fun by pointing that out to him. <laughs> Hal is so happy that I've been invited to come here and speak to you. And he's asked me to say two things for him. One, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> that the New York Times very recently published an article stating as fact the connection between education and a longer life. In parentheses, the New York Times is to Hal Holbrook what the Book of Mormon is to the folks out in Salt Lake City. <laughs> I say, why don't you read the Wall Street Journal sometime? <laughs> mm -mm. New York Times, then the Los Angeles Times. <coughs> anyway, number two. He's asked me to remind you all that enlivening the life of the mind is a grand thing to do, but beware of descending into the computer crouch for hours on end and giving up movement. <laughs> I told him that you all know that, but he has asked to be quoted on it. <laughs> and I'm not going to go into the physical position that he gets in when he wants what he wanted me to say to you, literally. You see, after years of resistance, firm, even heated resistance, <coughs> he gave in to the seduction of email communication as the little computer, a little mail station, was a gift from his children and now he's fallen prey to the late night lure of reading and answering email messages, and I promise you it truly does threaten his health from time to time. That's my opinion. When he gets going, he can remain hunched over that thing from midnight to 3 a.m., and I know that is no good. So his message to you is not, in fact, connected to any real problem that might in any conceivable way grow out, grow out of a person becoming active in a senior learning center. <laughs> but I'm passing it on because his intention was dear and friendly, and he would have very much liked being here with me to tell you the truth. I was, of course, happy to hear <clears throat> that the New York Times has decided to validate something I think we already knew, and certainly you did, that education can lead to a longer life. Learning is good for us and it's fun besides. And if it lengthens my life, I'm glad. Meanwhile, if it doesn't, then it's still a valuable and happy way to use hours that might not feel as productive as they did when I had children to raise. About those years of our youth, those happy days of frantic activity, whether single or married, whether earning a living or raising a child or both. I believe we'll all remember now that life came racing at us and we made decisions hardly understanding that we were constructing our lives as we hurtled through the days. When I was 30 years old, I didn't feel that I was hurtling through days, but now I think I was. Now I think that I made momentous decisions without enough consideration. Now I think I didn't even realize they were momentous decisions, but some were, and some were cause for regret. But we were living at a pace, and now we're living at a different one. Now I'm moving slower, but time isn't. Time hasn't slowed down one bit. But since I have, the difference in velocity makes me at least increasingly aware of the change. Like the difference in being in a car with another car moving along beside me, or being on the side of the road and seeing a car drive past. At this stage of the game, I often feel that the cars are going past and I'm standing on the side of the road. 
with a sense of time's evanescence and the desire to make it count, there comes the imperative to consider what to do with the time we have left to us, how to savor this new kind of day, this short, very short, and very precious day. It may not be easy to adopt new habits of contemplation and disciplines to reduce meaningless activity, but the effort is met with immediate reward. My brother Hal's widow Margot went to work at her church three years ago and has happened to learn how to pray, really how to pray because of it, and has managed to defeat the helplessness of her grief over my brother's death. Along with actively and humbly appreciating those treasured souls who make up our nearest and most beloved partners in life, our mates and our children and our siblings and our friends, we need now to redress the balance in the aging body to enhance the life of the mind. Exalting and encouraging learning <clears throat> offers at least two great rewards. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but first, better health and a happier existence. Andrew Weil, I'm sure you all are familiar with Andrew Weil, Wheel, I guess it's supposed to be pronounced, Wheel, the anti-aging guru in Arizona who has now repudiated, I find that interesting, repudiated the term anti-aging as bearing false promise, continues to remind us, Dr. Wheel, continues to remind us that nothing is as important to overall good health as satisfying mental activity. Putting the mind to work at or after 60 years of age gives the entire human system a recharge. And second, the supreme goal of acquiring knowledge is <clears throat> to achieve understanding. Remember, the, mount, the mind has a thousand eyes, the heart but one. You know who said that? My prayer at church of late for several years now is for understanding, starting with the people I know and love and extending to those I do not know and cannot love as Jesus has instructed us to do. <laughs> I understand the Learning Center is offering a course on Islam in the Middle East and uh, it would be good for my heart if I were able to get down here and participate in that course. It's a stunning, superior idea to be offering a course like that. I want to read you all about uh, learning and understanding. You know, this old book has been on my father's desk for just as long as I can remember. And uh, these poems may be corny, but they're great. This one is the things <clears throat> this one is entitled The Things That Are More Excellent. I'm not going to read all of it, but it's so sweet. I want to read three stanzas to y'all. As We Wax Older, it's by William Watson, The Things That Are More Excellent. As we wax older on this earth, till many a toy that charmed us seems emptied of beauty, stripped of worth, and mean as dust and dead as dreams. For gods that perished, shows that passed, some recompense the fates have sent. Thrice lovelier shine the things that last, the things that are more excellent. And it's a long poem, but I'm going to read the last two stanzas. The grace of friendship, mind and heart, linked with their fellow heart and mind, the gains of science, gifts of art, the sense of oneness with our kind, the thirst to know and understand a large and liberal discontent. These are the goods in life's rich hand, the things that are more excellent. 
In faultless rhythm, the overworlds. A rapturous silence thrills the skies, and on this earth are lovely souls that softly look with aidful eyes. Though dark, O oh God, thy course and track, I think thou must at least have meant that naught which lives should wholly lack the things that are more excellent. Isn't that sweet? That's y'all. That's y'all. That's what y'all are doing. Of course, the bookmark is always in. I can't read this without. It's so corny that the bookmark is always in. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers. That's my daddy, and things are not what they seem. Life is real. I remember hearing this. Did you all hear this from the time you could walk? Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul, they used to say with such feeling. Ronnie Claire Edwards, who is God lover from Oklahoma, but <laughs> she's the southerner. In, Oh, but her birthplace. She will get you, she will get a hold of you at a social event and say this, this part of this wonderful poem, Lives and Ronnie Claire. You all remember she played the lady with the store on the Waltons, Ronnie Claire Edwards. She's, <clears throat> she, uh, she's great. She's written a book. I can't remember the name of her book. It's so convoluted, but she's one of the funniest people in the world, but also one of the most intense. And she will say, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing. Leave behind us, Dixie, footprints in the sands of time. <laughs> so great. You gotta love Ronnie Claire. Well, now I brought up my daddy, and I, I am gonna tell you all. Um, I haven't left myself near long enough to talk about my family, but I, 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 I wanna tell you a little bit about. Yes, I'm from a little town. I was born in Mclemoresville, Tennessee. Here's my joke. When I was born, the population was 200. It has exploded since then to 311. <laughs> I wasn't born in Savannah, which today I have to work really hard not to be sorry about. But I, Tennessee Williams said, in the end, oh no, he said something that wasn't too positive to me. Uh, it was, um, there's no escaping it. That's how he started it, which might as well leave that. There's no escaping it. In the end, we are where we came from. Now, for Tennessee, obviously, the there's no escaping it sounds as if, you know, it b puts a certain shadow on it, doesn't it? But, <laughs> but I think in the end, we are where we came from. And I came from McLemoresville, Tennessee. And my childhood, I have to report, was idyllic. I haven't met anyone a couple of people, but hardly anyone, especially in show business, who had a happy childhood. And I did. We, the house is still standing, and my father's in it now. He is uh, an in, a complete invalid now. He's 96 years old. He lived with, uh, with us after my mother died, so he lived with us in, in Los Angeles almost 20 years. And when I would get mad at Hal Holbrook. I remember one night Daddy came and found me just sulking in a totally dark dining room, sitting in the dark, just sullen. And he caught me in there at late, at one o'clock at night. Precious, what are you doing in here? And I said, I'm mad at Hal, Daddy, and I'm not going upstairs. And he said, and I was no kid. I was, you know, 45 years old. And he said, he sat down in the dining room chair beside me, and he said, Precious, let me remind you of something about Hal. He's a good man. And all the reasons you may think of to underscore that point, I want to add another one. Who else could you have married that would let your poor old daddy come and live with you all this long time? 
said, I said, okay, Daddy, I'm not mad at him anymore. And I went up to bed. So, but my father called me, or I called him. I was working at the Carlisle two years ago, last September. And I was, I was on the phone with Daddy, and he was in Los Angeles, and he said, Precious, I'm getting some dying signals. I think I need to go back home. Will you take me? And I said, yes, sir, as soon as this job is finished. I, I will, Daddy. I'll, I'll, uh... And so Hal Holbrook, that good man, and they are hard to find, as we know, <laughs> um, packed up, and we moved. Uh, lock, stock, and barrel. We, we, we still had the house, and there was a housekeeper out there, you know, to look after it. But we pretty much moved for a couple of years back to Tennessee uh, to be with Daddy, who has survived to this point, and he's in the downstairs bedroom where he was born, where his brother was in that something. His brother and his sister and Daddy were born there. I was born in that room, and my brother and sister also. So it's not a castle, but it is definitely home. We, we grew up all in all to each other. There was my older brother, Hal, whom I mentioned before, who isn't living anymore. Um, there was me in the middle, and my baby sister, Melba Helen, who was mercifully nicknamed Midge pretty soon. <laughs> I, on the other hand, was named Dixie Virginia with nobody giving a thought to the fact that I might one day go to New York and have fun made of that name. I was named Dixie so fun wouldn't be made of my name. Then I went to New York and, you know, people said terrible, terrible things about me. So there was my brother and my sister and me, my mother and my father. And then next door was at my, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother would come in the summers and stay with us. And she lived in Memphis with my Aunt Helen. Next door was Papa and Mama Carter's house. And uh, so when I got a spanking, I could just run across the driveway. And Mama Carter would give me biscuit butter and sugar and rock me on her lap. <laughs> it was so sweet. My mother and father were beautiful. My mother and father were my movie stars. I didn't see a motion picture until I was seven years old. I saw the Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus before I ever saw a movie. And you know, I think I'm not the worse for it because what we had was stories read to us night after night after night after night. We had adults who talked to us and were interested in us. And Uncle Jack, also Jenna's brother who didn't marry. There was a strain of them, didn't marry till they were 50. I don't, don't ask me. I think 49 was the age, actually. 49, then they get married. But they stayed single till then. So we had the benefit of Uncle Jack coming and teaching us to read, teaching us to add, and uh, a little, little uh, blackboard set up in the, in the front yard. Oh, those were... Glorious days, and then <clears throat> I'll just tell you this, this one little story more because it, it's so vivid. Uh, Daddy was called, was drafted into the Second World War. He wound up going to Europe uh, in the war, and uh, but but when he first went away to basic training, we did not. I was too little to know what it was about. But my grandmother was crying, and and uh, my mother was. They were quiet and they were crying. And the Uncle Wiggly stories, which is what we were up to then in our reading at night, we loved. And Daddy would read them to us. He would describe it so dramatically, the skillery, scalery alligator. And whoa! And my mother would say, Halbert Carter, you're going to give those children nightmares. <laughs> it was so sweet. And then the night came before Daddy left. And uh, he read the Uncle Wiggly story for that night. And then my mother took all of our Uncle Wiggly books and put them in a cardboard box and put them under that bed, their bed, in that downstairs bedroom. And she said, we won't be reading these for a while. We're going to put these away while your daddy's gone. And we'll take them out again when he gets back. Well, that would 
let you know something really tremendous was going on. That and the atmosphere, of course, in the house. And he went away. I don't remember the day that he left, but my brother Hal does because he had decided he had to be the, he was only nine, and he, he had to be the one who took care of the family. You know, Daddy didn't have to go with a father with Parkinson's disease who was totally dependent upon him and three children all, but he just felt like it was his duty. If he was called, it was his duty, and I've always admired it so much. He went over to the grocery. We had stores. We had a grocery store in McLemoresville and a dry goods store there, dry goods store in Huntington where we all worked starting at 10 years of age selling candy. Oh, was that a great job. You sold it in the bulk back then. You, you dished it out and put it in the thing and put the weights up there and had a piece. <laughs> I mean, what else? The ladies in town would say, Virginia, you can't let those little girls have a free reign and all that candy. They'll be sick. She said, no, they'll be sick once. <laughs> and then it'll, it'll be over. But so uh, Daddy went out and, and he, he said that was when he, he nearly broke down was when he saw his little nine-year-old boy standing in the grocery store with a pencil behind his ear to look manly and businesslike. And he said, I'll take care of them, Daddy. Don't you worry. And well, he did. My brother, he milked the cow with the flu or whatever. He got out and milked that cow every morning. He brought in the wood for the fireplaces. We didn't have central heating. We had coal. He brought in the coal for the grate, the wood for the fireplaces. He could make the best cornbread I've ever tasted to this day. He learned how from my mother. So it's when she would go to the store, not daddy was in Europe, we would be left uh, there. Uh, with my brother and sometimes, you know, and my grandmother from across the road. And, but Hal's job was to have the cornbread ready by the time Jenna came in the door. He was very good at it. A anyway, uh, two and a half years after the Uncle Wiggly books got put under the bed, my little sister and I were sitting piddling with the eggs that Jenna, that's what we always called our mother, Virginia, Jenna had made us when she, she had gone upstairs to make the beds, and um, we're sitting in the kitchen fooling with eggs, which were never our favorite thing. And, and all of a sudden, you know, it was, it was one of those just etched in your memory. I know we all have those moments. It was a kind of a day where the air was blowing the curtains just a little bit. So I figured it must have been May, May or June, something like that. It was balmy, and not bad hot yet. And uh, the air was moving through that old house, and we were sitting there with our eggs, and we looked up, and there in the doorway stood Daddy. I remember now, looking back on it, that he looked so young, although he was uh, old to be going. He, he was, I guess he was 37 when he came back. But he looked so young, and he looked so happy, heartbreakingly happy, now I think about it, so eager and almost frightened, <laughs> I think, in my memory. And he said, let me, let me show you what he did. Hello? Hello? He said, can you hear me with this? He said, shh, so we wouldn't scream. <laughs> and then he said, Where's Jenna? And we sat there, motionless, paralyzed, with excitement and everything else, and said, <laughs> So he crept up the stairs, and we heard Jenna scream. And then it was quiet for a little while. And then they came back downstairs, and that night the Uncle Wiggly books came back out again, and we all lived happily ever after, and we did. <laughs> for the rest of his life, thank you, for the rest of his life after that, he has always loved to say, prettiest sight I ever saw, two little girls with their mouths full of egg. <laughs> Sweet. So now there he is, 24-hour, the sweetest people in the world live around there, 
and they come in and look after, and Aunt Helen, my mother's baby sister, who was in the cotton business, and then followed that with the health food store, which I'm, I've got to tell you all about, because I'm running out of time. I've got to tell you about the vitamins for the, you know, you've got to just <laughs> have a supply of them here at the Learning Center. <laughs> vitamins for the brain. <laughs> So Anne Helen turned up her toes a year ago last August and had herself a nice, big, huge stroke. So, <laughs> so, a drama, you know, she's dramatic. So, she's in the house too. We've converted the family TV room into Anne Helen's bedroom and it, it's sweet. I, I mean, it's, it's hard, and it's heart-breaking. I must say that the old wine bottle empties itself a lot sooner when I'm in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> that thing goes down, boy. But because, you know, it's just so sad. It's so, that's my daddy. That's, I'm, I don't have to tell you all. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But the thing is, it's so sweet. And Helen, in, she's okay, kind of, but she, she felt she was imposing upon me to stay there until I said, now, Aunt Helen, when I have to go back and make trips to Los Angeles to work, you have got to take charge of this house and look after things for me, which set her on the trail of being needed. And immediately, she was all right and not saying, I have, I mustn't stay, I'm imposing on you, darling. I mustn't stay here. So now, she's there, she feels like she's right to be there, and she checks on Daddy all the time. And sometimes he will say, Helen, I'm tired now. I don't want to try to talk to you anymore. <laughs> because no one in Aunt Helen's, that's my mother's side of the family, can hear thunder. I mean, <laughs> they cannot hear thunder and they eschew their hearing aids. <laughs> so, but she will come in and have a conversation where she can't hear a thing Daddy says, and he's weak, he's very weak, very frail, and finally he will say, Helen, go on now. I'm, but l let no one else get an idea from him that she is to be ushered out of the room or he rises up. He will say, don't tell Helen what to do. <laughs> They're very, very sweet, and if, if Daddy's being fed his breakfast and Aunt Helen's toilette isn't completed, all they have to say, the ladies there tell me, all they have to say is, Mr. Carter, we need to help Miss Helen get uh, out of the bath, um, shower, whatever, you know, get her hair finished. Oh, of course, go on and do for Helen. And the same, you know, she will say the same thing. Oh, Halbert. Oh, by all means. Hal yes, Halbert is my daddy's name. My brother's name was Halbert. We called him Hal, and I'm married to a Hal. <laughs> There's something wrong with it, I know, but <laughs> leave those waters murky and calm, we say. All right, y'all, I, I meant to go on and tell you about just the one or two great teachers I've had, what it means, but you all already know that, what it means to have a chance to learn something, what it means for the whole rest of your life, how important it is to all the rest of your life to feel that you've achieved in that area. I um. <clears throat> I married in New York and stopped my, I moved to New York to ostensibly to study singing because in my family at that time uh, the theater was such a wicked place or idea that, excuse my boots, I don't mean any disrespect, but I asked if it would be okay if I wore them boots I'm, it, because of the rain. Don't I catch a cold? Just excuse me. I thought I'd just stay back here behind this and you wouldn't notice it too much. But. So I met this very exciting man whose name was Arthur Carter. My name was Dixie Carter. So I thought, well, this is meant to be. And uh, I gave up the idea of having a career. I, I went, I told people in Tennessee, my family and people, except for my mother and daddy, I was going to study singing, but I wanted to have a career. And uh, 
I was advancing on it, and then I met Arthur Carter, and I married him, and um, it it didn't it wasn't the right thing to have done. I had two precious, beautiful little girls, so you know, so. You know, sometimes I think I would have, God would have given me those girls with another husband, though. <laughs> sometimes I think that. You know, they say, they say, well, you got your children out of it, so. But you know, sometimes I think I was destined to have those children. And they were destined, they came to be with me. But I won't go, I won't be, I won't be small. <laughs> I'll try not to be small or vicious. <laughs> So anyway, 10 years, y'all are so darling, 10 years, and then I try to go back to work, was very, very, very hard. My mid-30s, by the time I got a job and an agent, was, and my confidence, an unfaithful husband just your, your confidence is, you could go to a psychiatrist, f five of them a day, who would say, it's his problem, it's not yours, but you are going to think it's your problem. You are going to think something is wrong with you. I'm telling you, there may be, there may be no one in this room who's experienced such a thing, <laughs> but I'm just saying, what you really think in here is there's something wrong with you. So at 40 years of age, when I got a, my first television series opportunity and headed out to L.A., I was way too old to be going to Los Angeles. I knew it and everybody else did. But I went because I, I, I had to try to uh, worry about becoming financially independent and that television money was, you know, was waiting for me. So I went out to L.A when I was 40 years old, and I want to sing just a little scrap of this song. <laughs> Have you all ever heard the Statler, uh, Statler Brothers? Maybe. All the gold in California is in a bank in the middle of Beverly Hills in somebody else's name. So if you're dreaming about California, it don't matter at all where you played before. California is a brand new game. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. There is truth in every word of that. <laughs> but I met Hal Holbrook out there who said, don't leave. You're getting a pilot every year, and one of these shows, one of these shows is going to take off for you. So it, it did happen that way, and I thank God for designing women. She wrote Filthy Rich, uh, Linda Bloodworth, Thomason, first. And I did that show, and Delta and I were in that together, and then she wrote Designing Women. She had promised me that after Filthy Rich was canceled by the network that she intended to, she intended to write a show, she said, that would be more mainstream, and that she wanted to write it for me, and she kept her word. I have said here, if nothing else, yeah, that doesn't happen. You know, there's, a, there's an old showbiz expression, we were in love, but the show closed. <laughs> That's what usually happens. <laughs> if I have written down, if nothing else, oh, about Los Angeles, if nothing else would make you aware of advancing age, Los Angeles would do it. Okay. Uh, it's time for me to quit now, y'all, but here, quickly, I just want to say, go to the health food store. I was in a fabulous health food store today, and um, so I know y'all have got one. Take, for mental acuity, COQ10, or they'll tell you at the store, pycnogenol, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylserine, really important, pregnenolone, adrenal support, Folic acid, linoleic acid, panathenic acid, and vitamin C, B, and E. You must do this to be able to enjoy all this um, mental activity you're going to create. <laughs> okay, now y'all, I don't want to brag, but I just want to tell you that before I knew that I was going to 
be here with you tonight. I realized I had to do something about my mind, just on my own. And so I declared at the end of 2005, I was going to read something besides Agatha Christie, which I love. She's great, though, Agatha Christie. I don't want to make fun of her. But so let, can I just tell you all what I read last year? And then maybe, uh, maybe the Learning Center will give me a, a, a recommended list of reading. But I'm proud of this. Okay, here goes. I started off the year with the Odyssey. I read some Sophocles. I read Oedipus the King, Oedipus at Colonus, and Antigone. I read all the, the four Jane Austens that I, I, maybe I read Pride and Prejudice before, but I hadn't read Persuasion and Emma and Sense and Sensibility. Oh, <gasps> so, Crime and Punishment. And then I read the book that it seemed like there is some good thing about getting old enough, uh, which is what I had said to Patty Lyons, that there's a certain time in your life where you think, oh, well, I wouldn't have gotten this great joy out of this, maybe, if I had read it 30 years ago. War and Peace. Oh, baby. Crime and Punishment. Then I read War and Peace. And then I lightened up with Jane Eyre. <laughs> and... Um, I, all the time I was reading this fabulous uh, biography by Roy Jenkins of Chur Churchill, Winston Churchill. It's entitled Churchill. Adam Bede by George Eliot. The Hornblower series, the C.S. Forrester Hornblower series. There are these great books out there about Sarah and Gerald Murphy. They're very light reading, but those were the people who were, who were over in Paris in the 20s with John Dos Passos and Picasso and Hemingway. And it's, so anyway, so I read those. And, and this is the thing I'm proudest of. I went to the bookstore and I said, Marcel Proust, <laughs> I want to read Remembrance of Things Past. And it was crazy. They didn't have a book called Remembrance of Things Past. It's all divided up into Swan's Way and Germanti's Way. And, but anyway, I read the first volume and it was like opening French doors in a sultry, closed up room. And I'm feeling this tremendous sweet air come in on you. It was, it was wonderful. So I started this year with a book given me by one of the, the, the fellow who's writing my dialogue on Desperate Housewives, who was assigned to me, is named Joe Keenan. And he's a fan of the books by uh, P.J. Wodehouse. And he gave me The Code of the Woosters, uh, which I have finished. And I, did, didn't, I thought P.J. Wodehouse wrote the lyrics to Bill in Showboat. I didn't know he wrote 92. He wrote 92 books. Anyway, see, I'm learning. I'm finishing Truman by David McCulloch, because I was raving to my sister that John Adams was the best book I'd read forever and ever, and she said, oh, Diddy, if you like John Adams, you've got to read Truman. That, I think, is even better. So I'm finishing that. I'm reading another book by Chir about Churchill called Churchill Wanted Dead or Alive. The, oh, he's such a fascinating person to read about, The Boer Wars. And I am determined this year to get through Middlemarch. <laughs> you know, Joe Keenan, in his introduction to the, the book by P.J. Wodehouse, <laughs> <laughs> described a book as faint praise is in his definition saying something was funnier than Middlemarch. <laughs> I'm reading In the Shadow of Young Girls in Flower by Marcel Proust. I would try to say it in French, but I don't dare. And then because I can remember not as much as I wish I could of last year's reading, I've decided I'm going to read them all over again before I move on to anything else. Because, you know, whoosh, a lot of it's gone, isn't it? Ooh. And once again, I'm sure that I'm the only person in this room who's had that experience. And this May, Hal Holbrook is taking me to Italy. I've never been to Italy. It seems strange, especially since I love music and grand opera and all things Italian. I'm going to study the language before I go. They say that learning or attempting to learn a new language creates new neural passageways in the brain. And that's what we're all after, is new neural passageways. 
Tennessee Williams, at the end of his masterpiece, uh, uh, Streetcar Named Desire, has Blanche Dubois say to Stanley Kowalski in her last desperate effort for him to understand her, to be understood by him. And of course, Tennessee Williams wants to be understood by us. Blanche says, physical beauty is passing, a transitory possession, but beauty of the mind and richness of the spirit and tenderness of the heart are not taken away, but grow, increase with the years. So that's what I wish for all of you wonderful folks, those of you who are attending the Learning Center and those of you who are providing the Learning Center. I wish you those good things that Tennessee Williams has enumerated and every other good thing you can think of for you and for those you love. And thank you very much for having me. See, we can't thank you enough for a wonderful and inspiring talk that we all enjoyed and will continue to relive for quite a long time. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dixie's agreed to take some questions, and um, before I tell you how we're going to administer the questions, I want to make a couple of very quick announcements. One is that in the printed program that you received tonight, uh, you also received a small white envelope. And at the risk of sounding like we're in church and passing the offering plate, which we won't do, I do want to tell you that the Learning Center is the beneficiary of a couple of great grants. We have great registration, but our effort today and into the future is to keep every financial barrier to people taking part in our programs out of the picture. We don't want money to stand in the way of anyone's pursuing the kind of learning that Dixie has talked about tonight. Um, our nine week courses, for example, are at their most pricey $25 for the nine weeks. So you can imagine that at prices like that, we cannot make ends meet on a sustained basis. And therefore, if you believe in the kind of lifelong learning that we've been talking about tonight, I would ask you before you leave the theater to be generous with a donation that will go directly to programming in the Learning Center. And you can find anyone on the senior citizen staff wearing a name tag like the one I'm wearing uh, to give whatever donation you're uh, able to give, and we would certainly appreciate that. The other announcement I want to make is that Dixie Carter has brought books to sell, and that's exactly right. There are books uh, of hers, and if you've enjoyed listening to the kinds of stories that she's been telling tonight, there is more where that came from. Immediately following the question and answer session, she has graciously agreed to attend a small reception for people whose significant donations have made tonight's event possible. It's a private reception, but she has asked and we have agreed that she will go to the lobby immediately following that brief reception and greet all of you, donors or not, and to sign your books. And so our um, hope is that once the question and answer session has ended, you will go to the lobby and buy books for yourselves and for people who weren't able to be here tonight, and that you will wait just a little while in the lobby at a table where she will uh, appear, and she will talk with you and sign your books. And if you can't wait tonight, and particularly if you know people who didn't make it here tonight, I'm happy to tell you that she is going to visit with us tomorrow morning in the Learning Center at Senior Citizens Incorporated on Bull Street at Washington Avenue from 9.30 to about noon. And we invite you to stop by, have a conversation, um, buy books if you haven't already done so, 
and, uh, and get Dixie to sign those books for you. Um, thank you so much for being here. Let me tell you what we're going to do for questions. There's a microphone at the end of each aisle here in the front. And what I'd like to ask people to do, if you have questions, is to come to those microphones. And we have a couple of staff people who are going to staff those microphones. And we'll just go back and forth from one microphone to the other until um, your questions have been answered. Does anyone want to queue up and ask a question? Oh, OK, I'll give you the other mic. Please don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, Miss Dixie. Hi. I'm a Yankee. <laughs> please forgive me. You are a Yankee? Yes, please forgive oh. me. <laughs> but uh, we moved down here in 92 with my husband. He's in the military. I would just like to say, of course, I enjoyed your talk. You are a lovely, gracious woman and obviously very healthy, but not with, in a sick way, like a Hollywood way. How are you staying so firm? You look great. And you're wearing those boots like nobody's business, girlfriend. Thank you. Great. I, I work at it. Thank you. What's your name? My name is Charm. Sorry? Charm. Charlie? Charm. Like Lucky Charm? Like Lucky Charm? OK. I may have inherited that streak in my mother's family. <laughs> You want to know how I stay in shape? Without being goofy. I just, re I really try. I do, I think yoga is really good for you, stretching and yoga. I walk, and then lately I've started going to the gym and, um, and, and working with a trainer so I don't hurt myself and, and work, you know, try to get a little bit of strength. What, what you have to worry about as you get older is, um, Go, everything going forward, and I certainly have to worry about slumping. This young man says, you know, when we sit down, we shouldn't say sit down, really. We should say sit up, because we do sit down, and we go, we go forward. But thank you, Charm, for saying that I'm in good shape. I'm, I really try very hard to say, you know, you, if you want to work out in L.A., you kind of have to worry about the way you look. All the time. It's, it's tiring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Scott, and Scott. I was born in Martin, Tennessee. Martin. And, and I was, went to school in Carroll County over at Tresvent, down the road from McLemoresville. Tresvent's where my mother was born. Oh, okay. I just wondered, when you go home, what's your favorite thing to do for fun? My favorite thing to do for fun when I'm home is to go out in the backyard and sit out there with my husband and do nothing. <laughs> and just talk and talk and talk and look around. I go out by myself when he's not in town and watch the robins pull the worms out of the ground. I think that is my very favorite thing to do. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that and get together with my family. I love to see my brothers, you know, uh, m Scott, my brothers who passed away left three boys and they have children and so I love, you know, being able to see them. Martin, Tennessee, we used to play Martin in basketball. <laughs> but we got beat. Martin was a bigger town, much bigger. It wasn't quite fair. Yes, sir? Hey, Dixie, my name is Richard. I'm at avid fan. You've done wonderful work. Thank you. You are ageless. You look wonderful. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you. I had a question. Thank you. Um, what are your daughters doing now? And are they with you in Los Angeles or are they in Tennessee? One daughter has married and lives in New York and she's just uh, got a job writing for the London Economist wow. uh, writing reviews of um, Books and plays, I believe, is what it's going to be. And she was working for her father's newspaper in New York, the New York Observer, before that. Before that, she was writing screenplays in Los Angeles, but she made a big decision to change her career 
path. And my, my other daughter, the older child, who's just a year older, uh, Jenna, lives in Los Angeles, and she has become a playwright. She was always an actress and a singer and a dancer, but she's become a playwright, and she's, her plays are now getting some, you know, some, she was one, she performed at the Alley Theater in, uh, in Houston and uh, at the Roundabout Theater in New York, and my girls are my great joy, my whole big joy. Well, they were, I remember one episode of Designing Women when they, when they were on the show with you, and yes. they were just precious, just precious. Thank you. Yeah. They were still in school then. Yeah. yeah. They were little. They had all that makeup on. I thought they looked so strange with all that makeup on those little bitty faces. But. Thank you for sharing your, your, your stories with us and coming to see us in Savannah. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marianne. Hi. Marianne? Yes. Um, and my girlfriends who are here with me tonight had the privilege of seeing you in Lady Windermere's fan in Washington last oh. year, last summer. So thank you. It was delightful. And it was on my birthday, so it was a very nice present. Oh, I'm so glad you saw it. But it's I have two thrill. questions. Um, as a very successful actress at this point in your career, you have that star power. Do you still feel, though, at your age, do you feel any prejudice, even though you have, are a star? Uh, for age? Prejudice about age? In terms, oh. of, in terms of work in Hollywood. Oh, I should say I do. Mm -hmm. Yes, Marianne, yes. You know why I have this job now? Because Mark Cherry, who mm -hmm. wrote and created Desperate Housewives, did Patty tell you all that before? He was my assistant. He was my personal assistant in 1989. So. <laughs> And when he had this great success, he said he'd been thinking in two years what he could come up, what would come mm -hmm. along. He can't write, the way he does the show, he doesn't write anything for a specific right. actor or actress. But he was hoping that a storyline would come along where it, he could use Mrs. Holbrook, is what he still calls me, <laughs> Mrs. Holbrook, to good advantage. And so he called me um, early in the fall and said, hi, Mrs. Holbrook, it's Mark. And of course, I had thought two years had passed that's a show I'll never get on. Maybe I was mean to him when he worked for me or something. But he called and said, I've been thinking about for two years what I could offer you that would be different from anything you've ever done. And I just wonder, would you be willing to de-glam if you are? I think this is going to be a really good part. <laughs> so, so I had to. But it's given me an inspiration. You know, I have to keep my hair dark. I don't know. I, I've got to go ahead and let it get gray eventually, which it already would be if I didn't die, but it's been an adventure to put on that gray wig, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's been a big adventure, and it's, uh, you know, it makes you feel funny if you used to. Mm -hmm. But I dare not, for example, right now, let my hair get gray unless I really want to be relegated to, I don't know, what area, because the thing is, to play somebody's mother in Hollywood now, you still need to look 20 years younger than you would be if you were really the mother. I'm nodding my head because I'm an actress who, from Savannah who had moved to Los Angeles at the ripe old age of 35 and I stayed eight years and said no. I mean, it, but it was ridiculous. You just would wonder. Ridiculous. You would wonder where they got their sense of aging or a sense of women's age. I, I felt like they missed the 60s and 70s. It just disappeared from their consciousness. But my other question was... Yeah, it's true and it's a, it's a shame, but it is what it is, I guess. Stage versus television and film. Do you have a preference? Marianne, I like to have a job. <laughs> I know, I know. I like to pay the bills. So whatever I'm doing now is what I like to do. But, <laughs> you know, right now I'm doing Desperate Housewives, and I'm happy I'm doing that. If I'm working on the stage, I, will, I don't work on the stage. The only difference is I'll take a less wonderful part in television, you know, because of the money. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't do that because working on the stage is eight a week. It's really hard. So the point is for me is to 
improve myself, to have the joy of saying beautiful when I did Blanche in Streetcar, just to have the privilege of saying for audience after audience these gorgeous things. I did master class on Broadway uh, in 1997, the Maria Callas, the great play about Maria Callas, and uh, every night, it, it was very exhausting to do, but every night I had such a sense that I was being given the gift, you know, just to get to do it. So I, I believe that in the moment, the stage absolutely is a more satisfying and thrilling and nourishing place to be working. But I'm, I'd be hypocritical to say that I didn't, you know, relish uh, being well known and, and, and getting television work, although, although my age is pretty much, um, you know, it's difficult now. It's difficult for me. So I'm very grateful for the part on Desperate Housewives because that's started the Hollywood engine going again about me. It's just... Thank you so much. Nothing's easy. <laughs> Thank you for coming up, Marianne. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Dixie. My name is Barbara. Barbara. I wanted to ask you, uh, I think it was Charlene on the Designing Women that always talked about being from Poplar Bluff, Missouri. She did. Yeah, that's uh, the part of the country I'm originally from. That's where Linda Bloodworth uh, is from. And Arkansas, in that area. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Harry's from uh, Little Rock, and Linda's from Poplar Bluff. Uh -huh. I was just there a year ago, uh, this past fall. Um, I went to Poplar Bluff and sang for a benefit for her, to benefit her, um, her program for sending girls to college. She sent a lot of girls to college with her designing women millions. Millions, millions. <laughs> we didn't, none of us had any kind of a deal. Our, our revenue ended when the show ended and that's why I said millions, millions because you know that, that goes on forever for some folks. But, I still love her enough to go over to Poplar Bluff and sing for her. <laughs> I still enjoy watching the reruns of Designing. Wasn't it just so My good. husband likes yeah. it, too. I see those girls still. We see each other a lot. So what's ever happened to close. Anthony? Annie? Anthony. The Anthony. I, he was supposed to come to a party that I had uh, at Christmas time, and he didn't show up. He's still, or he's done a lot of work on Broadway. Mm. He's uh, had not the easiest time getting work. Uh, in television, and, and uh, he's uh, he's done those big musicals on Broadway, like The Lion King, that kind of thing. Yeah. Isn't he good? He was such a hoot on your show. Oh, I boy. loved him. <laughs> oh boy, he was supposed to be just one show, mm -hmm. and when he came on, it was the Thanksgiving show, and we were all bowled over. So it was clear that uh, Meshach was mm -hmm. a permanent. One final person. question: Are you a red hatter? Pardon me? Are you a red hatter? <laughs> Am I a redhead? Red Hatter. Red Society of Red Hats. <laughs> red Hats. The Red Hat Society. You don't know it? You, I didn't think you were over 50. <laughs> Y'all, don't make fun of me. <laughs> It's, it's a group of ladies, 50 It'll and over, cool. and we wear red hats and purple outfits. And we have fun. I never heard about it. No, it started in California. Well, and I'd like to, I'll join up. It's worldwide. Up. You should I'll join, join up. Red hats and purple outfits. Well, that's uh -huh. good for a start, Barbara. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Hello, Miss Dixie. My name's Dodie. I see I'm not the only one here that's only a decade away from an AARP card. <laughs> but I oh, wanted to ask you, and it's you a simple... mighty young. Thank you. That was the point. <laughs> I'm on a waiting list. Uh, a yes or no question, though. My friends Roger and Patty backstage, or Patty might be out here now, they don't know I'm about to ask you this yes or no question. Senior Citizens annually has a wonderful fundraiser and a silent auction. Look, they're looking. Yes, they're looking. And if you would auction off an autographed copy of that cornbread recipe, it would be fabulous. Would you entertain that thought? <laughs> Roger, write that down. <laughs> that, that was my job. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Dixie.
the cornbread recipe with your autograph on it for their next silent auction. Yes, Jody, I will. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Ginger, and uh, I'm so pleased that you came tonight. It was Thank wonderful. You. Uh, my question is that having enjoyed your performances, the dignity and power that you bring to every role that you played that I've seen, and your husband's wonderful uh, capabilities, I have seen him, um, been pleased to see him do Mark Twain tonight on several occasions. And My question is, do you collaborate? Do you share with each other your ideas of how to interpret what you are doing and um, ask each other for advice? In acting a role? Yes. Oh, that's a cute question, Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> My husband doesn't think that it's... Um, it's quite, what do you say, kosher to, it's like the rules of the road in, in the theater um, and in, in the in a film that you, you wouldn't tell another actor. You, I, I, I ask him sometimes things, but he's reticent. He doesn't. I, on the other hand, am full of suggestions, <laughs> lovely suggestions for him. The great Hal Holbrook. I mean, the nerve. I don't even know where it comes from. But I just have these irresistible impulses from time to time. We've done two new plays together. I think uh, Patty mentioned that. And they look at me. The rest of the cast looks at me when my, my mouth opens and I begin to offer advice. But at home, we give each other, we hold the book. And he holds the book for me and, and helps me with my lines when I ask for it. And I do the same, uh, the same thing for him. But um, it would be there, you know, he would be happy to, uh, to help me, I think. But we, ha we, haven't, uh, we haven't done that. It's a, I don't know what it is, but it's a, such a mysterious thing to make a part, to to make up a, to do a part. It's a mysterious and magical thing. And for me anyway, the less I talk about it, the better off I am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Kay. Kay. I just wanted to ask you, and this is probably strange, but I have to be a comedian too. Um, when you have the opportunity, tell your friend Delta I said hello. <laughs> I will. And the reason for that, I have had thousands of people to say that I look like Delta. And when I went to my Merle Norman I training. I can see it. I can tell. Do you? Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. When I went to Merle Norman training in um, Los Angeles, um, they nicknamed me Delta. And actually, one of the people that worked there at the Merle Norman home office asked me if I had had plastic surgery to look like Delta Burke. <laughs> okay. Really? <laughs> Thank you. And we do appreciate you coming to Savannah. I want to thank you all for coming tonight and remind you that Ms. Carter will be in the lobby Thank you. Um, afterwards, and please wait around. And if you can't wait around, please join us at Senior Citizens tomorrow. She'll be there from 930 to 1230. Thank you so much for coming. Out.